Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. We give our attention again to Jesus' sermon in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Jesus, it's fascinating, at, at least to me, to, to try to calculate the, the amount of time that the average person spends on very activities throughout their life. Like, for example, sleeping. Average lifespan, you can expect to spend 200,000 hours speaking, sleeping. It's 23 years of your life. If we use today's statistics, you'll spend that same exact amount of time in front of a screen every day. Brushing your teeth, 1,600 hours. It's about two months of your life straight brushing your teeth. If you look at this stuff online, an activity that people seem to be most interested in is, is how much time we spend waiting. You wait for lights to turn green, for web pages to load in line at the grocery store. The estimate that I came across was 62 minutes a day, which translates into about three years of your life spent waiting. But I'd say it's an awful lot more than that. I'd say that, that we actually spend pretty much all of, our, all of our lives waiting. Few and far between, I think, are those, those moments when we wish that, that time could stand still so that we could savor the experience forever. Much more often than that, our, our eyes are on tomorrow. Little kids, long to be big kids. Teenagers long for the freedoms of adulthood. Young couples, they, they wait and they save for their first house. We, we can't wait for vacation. Then when we're on vacation, we usually can't wait to, to get back home. And those are, the, those are the easy kinds of waiting. It's it a whole lot harder than that. Waiting for an end to uncertainty for healing from tragedy, waiting for, for peace in your heart, or for peace in your home. Little orphan Annie sang a song that resonated with the world. Today may be gray and lonely, but the, the sun will come out tomorrow. It's only a day away. And of course, as with all feel-good stories, Annie's Tomorrow did finally come, and, and she became the daughter of Daddy Warbucks billionaire. Not all stories turn out like that. Some people wait and wait, and it seems like tomorrow's always just going to be another day away. Open up to pretty much anywhere in your Bible and you'll find someone who felt like that. I'll give you just a couple examples. God tells a, a childless old couple to, to leave behind everything they know, to, to move to a strange land where he is going to, to give them a son through whom he's going to change the world and, and give them descendants as uncountable as, as the stars in the desert sky. 
And Abraham and, and Sarah, they, they believe him, they listen, and they go, and they wait, and they wait, and they keep on waiting in their tent pitched on foreign soil for more than 20 years. Not always so patiently. More than once, it seemed to them like that day would never come. Jump ahead 500 years from them. Abraham and Sarah, they had that, they had that son named, named Isaac. And just like God promised, he became a great nation, two million strong. But they're slaves under the thumb of Egypt. Their, their, their lives have, have been relegated to, to baking bricks and constructing the grandeur of the nation that has enslaved them. And they had, they had pretty much given up on God's promises of, of rescue and restoration in their own land. Even when Moses came and the, and the plagues began, I suppose they, they thought, well, better not to hope at all than just set ourselves up for disappointment. Page on ahead in your Bible and you'll see the Israelites waiting out 40 years to enter the promised land. Keep on going, you'll see a young man named David anointed by God to be king, but forced to, to run and, and hide from his predecessor, King Saul, who's trying to kill him. David had to wait years for vindication. And you, and you keep on turning the pages of your Bible all the way to the end, and you'll find countless people just like you who are waiting for, for relief, for certainty, for healing, for peace. Some of them... And, some of them in circumstances that are all their fault. Others in circumstances that are completely outside of their control. Others for, for doing the right thing. And sometimes it's, it's, it's one issue that's dragged out for years. Other times it's just one thing after another. Sometimes everything dumped on them at once. And that kind of waiting is hard. But that is not at all uncommon. Can you, can you guess what word in, in this passage all of this has been leading up to? Very last verse, first word of Jesus' sermon. He says, today. After Jesus was baptized, he started a, a preaching tour around the, around the synagogues in, in Galilee. Word about this new teacher was beginning to spread, and, and now it was time for a homecoming. Remember, Jesus had been born down in the southern part of Israel in Bethlehem. He was born down there, but he had been raised and worked construction for the first part of his life up in the north part in, in Nazareth. So that's where he is right now, and the people who had watched him grow up are about to hear him preach the, the sermon at the, at the Sabbath synagogue service, as is also the, the custom in our church. He first reads the passage that he's about to preach. It's a few lines from Isaiah where God promises a Savior sent by God and anointed by his Spirit to, to proclaim freedom and deliverance and relief to the poor and the blind and the captive. Jesus reads the passage and then he says, Today, the wait is over. You're witnessing history, folks. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The preacher is the fulfillment of his message. If, if you want to imagine what it was like to be there in the synagogue when Jesus made that announcement, you, you need to keep in mind that Jesus, he, he wasn't preaching this sermon down south in Jerusalem to a congregation full of, of cream of the crop Bible scholars. Nazareth was a whole lot different from, than Jerusalem. Back then, people talked about Nazareth the same way that some people disparage, say, like West Virginia today. Not exactly the land of, of opportunity. So don't, don't imagine Jesus preaching this sermon and making this revelation at the National Cathedral with only A-listers in attendance. Picture a, a room certainly no bigger than our fellowship hall. This is not at all Daddy Warbuck's mansion. This is Annie's orphanage. 
But Jesus doesn't lock eyes with the poor and the blind and the oppressed and say, oh, there's always tomorrow. It's only a day away. He says to them, today, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I think that Jesus could have preached that sermon, though, just about, just about anywhere. Because, because everywhere, even now, there are people who are in the middle of that hard kind of waiting. Some of them live in, in cardboard shanties. Others live on $10 million estates. Some of them sit in, in literal prison cells. Others of them feel trapped inside their own skin. And what they all share in common is that they long to be different, to be someone else, or, or at least to change themselves and, the, and their circumstances. They, they long for relief, for certainty, for security, for peace. Some of them try to, try to find it by changing their circumstances. More stuff, nicer stuff, neglecting their duties, abandoning their families. Others are, are more astute than that, and and realize that this isn't a, a prison that you can run away from or buy your way out of because no matter where you run and how far you go, you can't escape yourself. So they turn to their, their drug of choice for escape, but that only imprisons them further. Other people try to escape the prison through, uh, through the, the process of, of self-improvement determined to, to make themselves better, to be someone that they can be proud of, to turn their frown upside down. But then that, that, that smile is, is always only skin deep. Jesus could have preached that sermon anywhere because even today there are more than, than, than 7 billion people who either in whole or in part are poor and oppressed and hopeless and helpless. No matter how much they try to convince themselves otherwise, no matter how much they try to hide it from others, no matter how much they try to, to dig out of it or numb themselves to it, and they're left to hope that the sun will come out tomorrow, but tomorrow doesn't come. But Jesus doesn't preach a sermon about tomorrow, does he? He says to those people that aren't so different from us, he says today. And he doesn't go on by saying, let's get a show of hands in the synagogue here. Raise your hand if you're going to be the first person to take the step toward self-improvement. This passage on the scroll in Isaiah wasn't about people that are down and out, who, who dig down deep to dig themselves out. This is about a Savior sent by God and anointed by his Spirit to, to rescue people who cannot help themselves. And, and his message it's not, it's not how to be saved as if the recipe comes from him and the ingredients come from you. It's that you're saved. It's his work. And he says it's done. I'm sure that, that probably all of us can find ourselves somewhere in that passage from Isaiah. Prisoner to your own addiction abandoned and abused by the people who were supposed to love you the most. Maybe that your family fell apart is all your fault. And, and you hate yourself now more than you ever thought that you could hate anybody. Or worst of all, worst of all, Maybe when everybody looks at you, they think that your life is perfect. 
And that's actually a curse because you're left to face that misery all by yourself and to try to cover it up with a smile. And then when you, you, you try to, to think of the, of the people that Jesus came for, you, you imagine that the spiritual A-listers, but not people like you. So pay close attention to what Jesus preached and the people to whom he preached it and see that Jesus is preaching to you. He doesn't promise you a, a brand new car to distract you from your troubles or, or, or a pill to numb you to your pain. It's not a 10 steps to a better you program. What he preaches is himself. For more than a thousand years, God had been sending prophets who proclaimed that, that, trust me, God will send a Savior, sent by God and anointed by his, by his Spirit to help those people that can't help themselves. When Jesus preached, it was different. It was no more, just wait and trust me. It's the wait is over. I'm here. There's a, there's a very real sense in which God's people really are waiting. We don't know how many more times the sun will rise on us as we live in this broken world. And while we're here, we're still going to face the pain that comes from living in a broken world and the pain that comes from broken relationships and, and every other kind of trouble that's, that's, that's wrought by our own sin and everybody else's sin. But there's also a very real sense in which we're not waiting. The Savior that God promised through Isaiah came. And he, he lived under God's law, and, and he died under God's wrath in order to restore you to your God who, who made you for himself. That's not something that you're waiting for. That is something that's already done. And, and you may feel like you're just too broken or too fake or too abandoned or that you've, you've sinned too much or stayed away too long to ever come back into God's good graces. And that may really be the way that you feel. But just because you feel that way does not make that the reality. The reality is, is that Jesus died for you and Jesus still lives for you. To borrow from the Psalms, right now you're the apple of his eye and you're safe in the shadow of his wings. And tomorrow, again, we don't know how many more times the sun is going to rise on us in this broken world. Just like Abraham and, and Sarah and, and Isaac and David and, and countless other people in the Bible, we wait. But we don't wait alone. And, and, and we don't wait for something that might never come. We wait in the arms of Jesus. We wait in the arms of the one who died for you and lives for you, and he's holding on tight. And he's not going to let go until the day that you join Abraham and Isaac and David and countless others in the visible presence of the one who proclaimed and delivered peace and security and relief for the most helpless of people including you. Amen.